for many years prior to 2013, in its print and its television advertising, the sports drink Gatorade used a simple slogan. It was a slogan paired, you may remember. It was paired with images of athletes glistening with colorful beads of sweat as if the sports drink was oozing out of their pores. <laughs> Do you remember that? Do you remember the slogan they used? It was, Gatorade, is it in you? Is it in you? Gatorade, is it in you? I believe that phrase was meant to communicate something like this. Do you have what it takes to be a winner? Do you have what it takes? Is it in you? And then that question is visually connected to the famous sports drink, as if to say, winners drink Gatorade, <laughs> right? <laughs> winners drink Gatorade. That's what I think the guys on Madison Avenue, whoever, advertising agency, were thinking, you know, when they came up with that slogan. This morning, God's word is not asking us a question about whether or not something is in us. It is simply going to make a statement about something that is in us, about the truth that something truly is in us. And we find that statement in the Gospel of John chapter 2. Turn there to John chapter 2 if you have not done so already. We're picking up again on this uh, study that we began in January through the Gospel of John. And we've had an amazing time so far being able to uh, receive all that God has for us um, in this book. When we last saw Jesus in our previous study, He, His mother, and His disciples, you may recall from that last verse, uh, John, uh, John chapter 2, verse 12, he, his mother, and his disciples had all traveled to Capernaum. Remember, they were at that wedding in Cana, a town called Cana. But they had gone down to Capernaum, which was a town on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. But as we pick up the story here in verse 13, we're going to see that Jesus is on the move again. Look what it says. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons. And he found money changers, the money changers, sitting there in that courtyard in the temple. And making a whip out of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers. And he overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written. This is in the Old Testament. Psalm 69. They remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews, and when we read Jews, oftentimes in the Gospel of John, it's meant to indicate the Jewish religious leaders. So the Jewish leaders said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years. It's been 46 years that this temple has been under construction, is the sense of it. It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he, Jesus, was speaking about the temple of his body. 
When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify, to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, Clearly, there's a lot to think about, right? There's a lot to think about in these 13 verses. But look back at those last two verses of this passage, of this chapter, of this section. Let's ask, in light of verses 24 and 25, let's ask this. What can we know about what Jesus knew? What can we know about what Jesus knew as it indicates here? We read, Jesus knew all people in verse 24. But what does that mean? He knew all people. Well, look at verse 25. We read there, He Himself knew what was in man. So He knew all people in the sense that He knew what people are like. He knew what was true of every person. And what was true of every person is that there is something inside every single one of us. Therefore, the question for us becomes this morning, what exactly is in us? What is in us that Jesus knew that is is affecting His actions here, that, that is highlighted in these verses? And additionally, we might ask, does this passage help us with that question does it expand on that question in some way how does it also speak to that question uh, from that we've derived from the last two verses of the passage so think for a minute about what we've been told so far good bible study means that when we're looking at a passage we're trying to think about the context right we're not just ripping verses out of the context so that we can use them however we want to use them We're not just ripping verses out of context so we can slap it on a billboard, slap it on a bumper sticker, slap it on a wall plaque, slap it on a mug, right? And feel good about ourselves that we've got Christian stuff and we're saying Christian things. No, we want to understand God's Word in context. That means one of the things that we need to do when we read a passage like this is think about what have we seen before this? What's led up to this point? I want to point you back to a verse that we we saw many weeks ago. It's in John chapter 1, verse 5. Take a look at that verse. John chapter 1, verse 5. We'll put it on the screen as well. John 1, 5. It says in John 1, 5, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, given that context, that verse does seem to work off of the idea that in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, when God created all things, there was darkness, and He said, let there be light. But if we look at the context here in John 1, not Genesis 1, even though it's using those images... This verse, John 1, 5, seems to be speaking about more than just light and darkness in the original creation. It seems to be talking about a kind of moral, spiritual darkness. Moral, spiritual darkness. But is that what John is talking about in chapter 2? Jesus knew that there was a moral spiritual darkness in human beings. I believe this is exactly what he's talking about here in John chapter 2. Just as he spoke about the Word who made all things, the Word through whom God made all things, that he's, He was light and that light was the life of men, then that light, 
broke into our darkness. In that same way, the Word who became flesh knew that, knows that darkness inside of human beings. So that's the, that's the premise that we're going to work from, that what Jesus knew was in us was this darkness mentioned in the previous chapter. Let's see if that actually fits with the context here, okay? Let's see if that works well in terms of understanding this. So working from that premise, let's look at each of the three parts that make up this section. All the verses I read to you this morning, verses 13 through 25. Let's break it down into three sections and let's see if they reveal anything to us about this moral spiritual darkness. So first look back at verses 13 through 17. Look at how verses 13 through 17 establish the setting for us. The setting, where we are, what's going on. Here's the situation, right? Jesus is in Jerusalem during the Passover. And he is most likely in the outer court of the Jerusalem temple complex. So remember, Solomon, the son of David, had built a temple to God. That temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. When the exiles came back, they built a second temple. But that second temple was later added on to by Herod the Great. He was the puppet king under Rome's power who controlled that area of Judea. He was at least meant to think he controlled it, right? He had some uh, uh, authority there. But he was uh, trying to ingratiate himself with the people, the Jewish people. So he would pour money into making the temple even greater and grander. And he had been doing that well before the time of Jesus, starting, I believe, in 19 B.C. So about 18 or 19 years before Jesus was born, Herod was building this temple. Remember, this is the same Herod that tried to kill kill Jesus as a baby. (laughs) That's the same Herod from the Christmas story. So this temple began to be expanded. And in this court of, uh, this outer court of the temple complex, Jesus, as we read here, he finds what? Vendors, right? He finds vendors. It's like a flea market down there. It's not really a flea market in one sense, but what are these guys selling? They're selling animals for sacrifice. They are also exchanging international money, Roman money, for the proper coins to pay the temple tax, which was expected of every Jewish man and woman. The temple tax was just meant to keep the temple in, you know, sustained pay for the, the, the costs associated with running the temple. That, we see that from the Old Testament onward. So they needed a particular kind of coinage, the Tyrian coinage that they used for that temple tax. So there are the vendors who are there selling the animals. There are the money changers who are exchanging the money. In general, these were legitimate and necessary services, especially if you were a pilgrim coming from who knows where. Right? You're not going to be bringing all of these animals with you to sacrifice if you're coming to sacrifice to God at the temple in Jerusalem. Much easier just to buy them there. You're not able to exchange your money if you live in Carthage. You're not able to exchange your money if you live in Greece or in Rome. You need to come and do that there. Legitimate services, especially for pilgrims. But As we see here, as we understand something about the temple itself, we recognize those things should not have been taking place in the temple itself. They simply should not have been taking place in the temple itself. It's actually the other Gospels that give us a better sense of why Jesus took such radical action here. We read in Mark chapter 11, verse 17, we read actually about a later instance of this same kind of temple court clearing. Yeah, it's John's Gospel that actually reveals to us, we would have never known it apart from this, It's John's gospel that actually tells us that Jesus didn't do this just once. He did it twice. John tells us there was an episode like this at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. 
Now for me, that makes a lot of sense as to why the religious leaders were so aware of Jesus, that, he, they, that, that, that this incident put him on their radar. So when you read Matthew and Mark and Luke, and the Jewish leaders are kind of checking him out and, and really assessing him, critiquing him, this helps us to understand why he was on their radar. And it also helps us to understand that there was a later temple clearing when Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem uh, on Palm Sunday, as we've talked about during Holy Week, when he entered in, that he found the temple courts in exactly the same way as he had several years before. And again, he went back and did the same thing. This time, he knew with consequences, with a ripple effect that would lead to his death. But in that later instance of this same radical action, we read in Mark chapter 11, verse 17, take a look on the screen. It says, and he was teaching them. He's teaching them as he's doing this. He's declaring to the people, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. He's teaching them and saying to them, is it not written? Table overturned, cord whipped, snap. Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. You see, the outer court where all this business activity was taking place was called the court of the Gentiles. And this court of the Gentiles was that place where non-Jews, where the nations should have been able to come and pray and worship the God of Israel. But how could they with all this business, all this busyness, with all this traffic, with all this merchandising taking place? And on top of that, just as we, we heard, Jesus also labeled what was happening as a den of robbers. That's how he described it. This is a den of robbers. Apparently, some prices for animals, some exchange rates were anything but fair. Many vendors were simply focused on profits. They were not focused on offering a spiritual service to pilgrims who came to worship. They were simply focused on profits. These specific wrongs lay behind Jesus' words here in John 2.16. Look again. Take these things away. Do not make my Father's house a house of trade. It is my Father's house. It is not a house of trade. My father's business should be taking place here, not your business. But isn't this temple trade that we read about here, isn't that an example of what's in us? Isn't that an example of what's in us? Like these vendors and like the religious authorities who permitted such things to take place, maybe even benefited from them in some way. Aren't we, if we are honest with ourselves, the kind of people who also warp worship? Don't we warp worship? Aren't we the kind of people who subtly take sacred things and turn them into self-serving things? Who make opportunities to glorify God opportunities to glorify ourselves who put financial gain or social gain or some other kind of gain before true spiritual gain aren't we those kinds of people if we're honest with ourselves aren't we the kind of people who even when it comes to ministry and to fellowship 
And yes, to worship, aren't we the kind of people who tend to think less about God's will and the needs of others and more about what we need, about what we want, about what we can get, about maybe what we're not getting out of it, therefore we'll move on, we'll try something else? But look back again at the passage. Look at how the religious leaders here react to the disturbance Jesus has created. He's created quite a disturbance, hasn't he? You can imagine being there, right? I'm going to change this coinage out. All of a sudden you hear this crazy guy running through, making all the sound of animals being scurried off, people yelling, what are you doing? You know, tables being ever turned, the sound of the coins flying through the air and bouncing off the stones, right? Just a din, this noisy, erratic, frantic situation. They come to Jesus, these religious leaders, and look at how their, that their first response, notice it's to question Jesus. That's their first response. We heard their question in verse 18. What sign do you show us for doing these things? That is, to put it differently, who do you think you are? <laughs> Who are you to do such a thing? But, but isn't that an, another example of what's in us? Do you see that? It's an example of what's in us. These leaders have trivialized the truth. They've trivialized, they've minimized the truth of what Jesus did and said and instead, they want to focus on who do you think you are coming in here and doing and saying such, such things. Never mind what you actually did. Never mind what you actually said. Who do you think you are to do those things? Wouldn't the right response from these leaders, wouldn't the right response be to take the radical actions and the revealing words of Christ to take those things to heart? To actually just take them to heart? To stop and confess He's exactly right. What are we doing? Why is this taking place? Why is any of this taking place? These things should not be happening here. He's exactly right. Instead of humbly accepting this as a challenge to their behavior, it seems they only can see it as a challenge to their authority. But isn't this all just ancient history? <laughs> Good thing our leaders today don't do the same thing. <laughs> Friends, we've just lived through a political cycle in which there was, sadly, very little humble consideration of the merits of competing policies, whether by the candidates or by their supporters. But there was a whole lot of who do you think you are's being tossed around. There was a whole lot of that, a whole lot of, I don't have to really consider anything you're saying because you're you, because you're with them, because you're all alike. But aren't all of us like that in some way? Don't our leaders simply reflect our own hearts? We're too quick to get defensive but too slow to search our own hearts, to carefully consider what's happening inside, to carefully consider what someone else is saying, the truth of it, not how it makes us feel, not radical generalizations and stereotypes, caricatures, caricatures, but really to carefully and humbly consider our own hearts and the truth of what is being said. We care a lot more about what's cool, what's comfortable, what's convenient than we do what's true. All of us 
in subtle and not so subtle ways tend to trivialize the truth. But there's one more example. There is one more example here of how this moral, spiritual darkness John mentioned in chapter 1 plays itself out in chapter 2. Remember what John told us about Jesus in those final verses of this chapter. Look at 24 and 25 again. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, about mankind, about human beings, for he himself knew what was in man. So what does it mean that Jesus did not entrust himself to the many who believed in him because of the signs? Well, to answer that question, we need, I think, to fast forward a few chapters up to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. There is a similar situation taking place in John chapter 6. Listen to how this similar reaction to the crowd, reacting to the miraculous signs of Jesus, listen to where it goes and how it corresponds to what we're looking at here in John chapter 2. So this is John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. When the people saw the sign that he, Jesus, had done, they said, "Uh, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then, Jesus, perceiving then, that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, what did he do? Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Ah, this seems to be the context for John 2, 25. 2, 24 and 25. So just as Jesus, remember what Jesus had told his mother in the last uh, story that we saw at the beginning of John chapter 2. He told her in the first half of chapter 2 at that wedding in Cana, he said, his hour had not yet come, verse 4. My hour has not yet come, he told her. Though the crowds wanted to publicly promote him as king, Jesus' hour had not come. That was not God's plan. And not only was the timing wrong, but Jesus understood how that darkness inside shaped their ideas about kingship. How they wanted to use Jesus for their own ends. You see, not only do we warp worship, not only do we trivialize truth, We also impose ideas on others, our own ideas of what is good, of what is right, of what is acceptable, of what will work, of how things should be. That's what that moral, spiritual darkness looks like in us. For these crowds, their ideas about the Messiah and the Messiah's battle and the Messiah's victory, and the Messiah's glory, those ideas were very different from God's plan. From the truth about the Messiah's battle, the true battle, the true victory, the true glory through the shame of the cross. That's why Jesus would not entrust Himself to them. He understood the darkness inside them. Of course, it is absolutely critical to emphasize, to be clear about the fact that he also understands the darkness inside us. He knows what's in us. Brother, sister, friend, He knows what's in you. He knows what's in you. Jesus Christ, even today, at this very moment in time, He knows what's in you. Remember how John expresses his statement in very generic terms, right? General terms, broad terms. 
he says that he knew all people. It's not that Jesus just knew these people, right? The people there. He didn't just know the vendors and the money changers. He didn't just know the religious authorities. He didn't just know the people who believed the signs. They were awestruck by the signs that he was doing. It says he knew all people. He himself knew what was in man, mankind, in every human being. John is talking about all of us. He wants his readers, whether then or now, to understand. He knows all of us. He knows what's in us. John is writing about you. Look at this statement. Jesus Christ knows what's in you. But do you? Do you? When it comes to others, and especially to God, do you recognize that you also warp worship and trivialize truth and impose ideas, your own ideas, on situations and people. And that you do so because there is a poisonous principle of moral, spiritual darkness at work in your heart. Friends, there is no true benefit for any of us in terms of the wonderful wisdom and wonderful work of God for us if there is not first a recognition of what is in us. We can neither embrace nor enjoy the light of Christ if we are not honest and continually honest about our own darkness. This is precisely why Cultural movements that teach only self-affirmation and so-called churches that teach only a positive sin-light or sin-less version of the gospel are so very dangerous. The second half of John chapter 2 has to be either a wake-up call for us in terms of this personal darkness or a much-needed, sobering reminder of that inner enemy we face every single day. The Bible calls it our flesh. Now, some of you might hear this and think, wow, this is a downer. (laughs) This guy's really negative. Wow, some people are going to hear this, and they're going to think, that they're pretty crappy, right? They're going to think that they're pretty worthless. Friends, that is not at all what I'm saying. God's Word teaches us that each and every person is created in the image of God. That every single person in this world who has ever lived, who's living now, and who will live has incredible worth because they are God's creation and they are made in his image and he has a purpose and a plan kind for mankind in general that is glorious he has lavished his love on humanity in a way that is incomparable but that does not change the reality of what is in us We need to hold on to both of those things. We need to be able to hold on to our value and our worth while at the same time saying that we are corrupt spiritually, that we are broken, that we are morally impoverished. If we only said that, that would be a problem, that we are worthless and no good and nothing But if we only say that we are of great value and you are awesome and you are special and there's no one like you and you find your truth, right? And you speak your truth and you be you and all of that stuff, that's a problem too. That's just as bad as the other direction. The Bible actually finds that balance and holds on to both things and says you have incredible worth, but you are incredibly 
dead in your trespasses and sins. You are a rebel, even at the love of God, even as the love of God has been poured out upon the world and God's open arms are inviting you in. You see, this is the truth. God is calling us to faith in light of that truth about the darkness. But please remember this. Faith doesn't fully finish the darkness. Faith doesn't fully finish the darkness. John 2, 23 tells us that the very people to whom Jesus would not entrust himself were the very people who had believed in his name. Do you see that? Those are the people he would not entrust himself to. The very people who had believed in his name. You see, that kind of sign-inspired but knowledge-lacking faith was the right first step. Awesome first step. It was a critical spark, but more was necessary. The disciples were growing in knowledge, weren't they? In contrast, the disciples we see in this passage, they were growing in knowledge. They were both witnessing the signs, they were listening to Jesus, and they were connecting these things with the Old Testament Scriptures. So they're growing in that knowledge. Their faith is feeding off of these things and growing in that knowledge. But what about us today? How does God, through John, want to feed our faith with a sound and profound vision of Jesus? Well, I think He wants us this morning to meet Jesus, the temple preparer. Jesus, the temple preparer. Jesus is preparing the temple here. He wants us to trust in the one. God wants us to trust in the one. John wants us to trust in the one who has come to do what? To restore true worship. Why do you think he's doing what he's doing in that temple? It's a prophetic act. It's a symbolic act. Yes, it had its purpose for a limited time. Clearing that court out, getting people out of there. It probably, that probably didn't last very long, right? If Jesus really wanted to to clear that court, he he would have needed to have done something else to actually clear it for weeks or months. Didn't have the power to do that. He created a ruckus. Why? Because it was the the work of a prophet who is making a, 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 a declaration through his actions. He was preaching through his actions. And what was he preaching? That he had come to restore true worship, to purify it so that it becomes all that it was meant to be. When Jesus leaves Jerusalem, whether days or weeks after this, we don't know. When he leaves Jerusalem and returns to Galilee, he will meet a woman along the way. And he will tell this woman the very same thing. He says, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers, hear that? True worship. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. John 4, 23 How did Jesus make this true worship possible? Through the temple. Through the temple of His body, though. Do you see that? Through the temple of His body that John mentions here in verse 21. The Jewish authorities wanted what? They wanted a sign from Jesus. And they would get one. Not right away, but they would get a sign just as they had contributed to the moral and spiritual destruction of that Jerusalem temple by allowing those vendors, by allowing that trade, by allowing that deception, by allowing that merchandising to take place, these same men would bring about the physical destruction of Jesus' own body on that Roman cross. But brothers and sisters, hold fast. Hold fast, friends. 
Hold fast to Jesus' declaration there in verse 19. Look at it again. Verse 19, he says, in three days, I will raise it up. In spite of all that you're doing, in spite of what you will do, in spite of your darkness, I will raise it up. I will raise up this temple of my body that you will destroy. You see, while the church is often talked about later in the New Testament in these temple terms, right? The church as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Believers as uh, a temple of the Holy Spirit. If we really understand this passage if we really understand what it's pointing us to, if we really understand what is in us, then the risen Jesus must always be our first temple. The risen Jesus must be the first place our hearts and, mind go, our hearts and minds go when we talk about our temple. The Lord Jesus. Why? Because He is where we go to meet with God. He is where we go to have access to God. He is where we go to find atonement for our sins, forgiveness. He is where we go to worship in spirit and truth. He alone can bring us, verse 16, to the Father's house, which he'll go on to talk about even more. He alone is that purified place, that pure place in which every single one of us, all the nations can truly come into God's presence with praise. Jesus Christ, our temple, our temple preparer. Here's the key question for you this morning. Have you acknowledged personally? I'm asking you, God is asking you personally. Don't think in generalities. Don't think in vague concepts. Don't think in, oh, this is such a good message for such and such. I hope they're listening. Oh, I need to pass on this link. I need to share it with this person. They need to hear this. No, God is talking to you. He is asking you, have you acknowledged and do you regularly acknowledge not what was said to you, not what happened to you, not who failed you, not how people see you, not what influences you or entices you or distracts you, but what's in you. In you, darkness, the darkness in you, have you acknowledged it? Do you regularly acknowledge it? We have to, brothers and sisters. As hard as it is, we have to, friends. Remember what I said before. We can neither embrace nor enjoy the light of Christ if we are not honest and continually honest about our own darkness. We don't need the good news if we don't believe the bad news. We don't need a Savior if we don't believe the truth about our sinfulness, our desperate condition. But here's that wonderful good news. If Jesus Christ has the power to raise himself from death to life, then you better believe he has the power to deal with what's in you. Because that's in fact what he was doing when he raised himself to life. Power to deal with what's in you. You're not on your own. Power to deal decisively with what's in you on the cross and daily in terms of application. Power to raise you up to walk in newness of life. Power to shine a light in you that cannot be overcome. Do you believe that this morning? If you do, live it. Live it. If you do, it's time to confess that darkness and to ask God to give you daily that same knowledge that Jesus had and has still today. The knowledge of what's in us. The knowledge of what's 
in you. Let that knowledge guide you by guiding you to the knowledge of God with the right mindsets. We don't come to God the right way unless we are, tr we are telling the truth about ourselves. So don't shy away from that knowledge of what is in you because it should lead you to God. It should bring you to Him. The knowledge of what is in us, in each and every one of us. Let's ask together, God, let's go to Him and ask Him to do that very thing, to help us in that very way. Let's, let's, let's go to prayer.